Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome today to this joint event hosted by New America's Open Technology Institute and Consumer Reports. Um, we're excited to have uh, to be hosting some great experts on the two panels that are coming up, but I will let our moderators e introduce each of them to you. So we're here to talk more about labels, some you might recognize and some that might be new to you. Consumers often rely on labels to help them choose products to identify information that is important to them and to make comparisons between the options that are available. Our first panel will be discussing existing labeling schemes in a variety of different industries. Our second panel will be discussing potential labels of the future and some really interesting projects going on in the tech space to revolutionize the labels that consumers see. On that note, I'm gonna introduce our first moderator, Justin Hendricks, the editor of Tech Policy Press. Thank you, Andy. Thanks for New America for hosting this. Uh, so pleased to be here. My name's Justin Hendricks. I'm the uh, CEO and editor of a site called Tech Policy Press, which looks at the intersection of, of technology and society. And so this is a great topic to be talking through today. We're going to talk a little bit about um, how some label models have been more successful than others, but across uh, multiple industries, you know, we see uh, some best practices emerging, and we're going to talk about how we can apply those in the technology space, which I'm excited about. Um, we've got three great panelists today, and I'm going to introduce each one of them. Uh, they're going to give a little bit of a, a, a background on who it is that they are and what expertise they bring to this topic and uh, some of the things that they're thinking. Um, and then we're going to have a bit of a discussion uh, and hopefully bring in some of your questions as well from the floor uh, as we move along. So really looking forward to this and, and thanks to our panelists for, for joining us. And I'm going to just go down the list and, uh, and, and invite you all to make a, an opening comment to start. Uh, and I'll start with, with Brian, with Brian Ronholm. Uh, who is Director of Food Policy at Consumer Reports. Um, Brian will tell you a little bit more about his background. Um, we're not going to do lengthy bios here, but I will tell you this. Uh, if, you, if you look in, in detail at his background, you'll see that if you've ever had an egg or eaten a catfish in this country, you have him to thank for the fact that it's safe. So, uh, Brian, welcome to the panel and perhaps give us a rundown of some first thoughts. Sure thing. Thanks, Justin. It's great to be with you all. Good afternoon. Um, as Justin indicated, I'm Brian Ronholm. I'm Director of Food Policy at Consumer Reports. And in my background, I served at the U.S. Department of Agriculture as Deputy Undersecretary for Food Safety. Thus, that is the agency responsible for meat, poultry, and as Justin said, um, catfish and, and processed egg products. And prior to that, I worked um, on Capitol Hill as a congressional staffer. And um, Justin, should I go ahead and start or do we wanna do f intros of the others? Absolutely, let's go ahead and get some uh, first thoughts from you and then I'll, I'll go to, to Quinta and then to Kyle next. Sure, the, so the issue I'm gonna cover today is the nutrition facts label that we're all familiar with. And those labels, as you may know, first started appearing back in May, 1994. And that was the result of the passage of the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act, the NLEA, which was signed into law in November, 1990. So of course it took a few years for those rules to be written and go into effect. Um, and the aim was really clear. It was to help consumers make better nutrition choices and encourage food companies to make healthier foods now, before this law was enacted, there was some information that was required on packaged foods, but it was limited. And it was limited to nutrition information. Um, it was required only when there was a nutrition claim being made. Otherwise, there was no kind of expansive information available for consumers. So the, the enactment of this law obviously expanded the availability of this nutrition information. And it specifically required food packages to contain a detailed standardized nutrition facts panel that included information such as serving size, calories, grams of fat, saturated fat, carbs, fiber, sugars, protein, cholesterol, sodium, and certain vitamins and, and minerals. So since it first started appearing back in May 94, there has been some revisions. So trans fat was added in 2006, and then added sugars was included in 2016. And the purpose, of course, was to reflect current science, current, current data on, on these items. So the serving size also was updated so that it would reflect how much of that item people typically consume at one time. 
And the serving size question was probably been the most confusing for consumers to grapple with. Uh, serving sizes on food labels are required to be based on the amount of a product that people typically consume during one occasion. And you know, I'm sure during this time, we've all encountered this situation where we pick up a food product and we notice, hey, this, this bag of snacks is only 150 calories. This is great. I'm really in the mood for these um, so I can just eat this whole package. But then when you read the label more clearly, you recognize that, oh, it's only 150 calories for one serving, but there's three servings in the bag. So really you're looking at 450 calories. And that I think that was a source for a lot of confusion for a lot of consumers. And, and I'm sure, you know, the industry was quite pleased with that that type of confusion as it led to more uh, purchases and kind of a misleading belief that certain products were, were healthier than they otherwise would be. So the update in the serving size information was meant to address this issue and make it more clear for consumers to understand how much they were consuming. And also the amount for some items that people consume has significantly changed since the original law went into effect. So it was important to update this requirement to reflect current consumption habits. So now for packages that contain between two and three servings, companies are required to provide a dual column that displays the total amount of calories and nutrients per serving and per package. So this is obviously meant to make it easier for people to understand the calorie count for the entire product package. So when you look at the product now, it's like, okay, I really will be consuming 450 calories not 150 calories. So overall, as you can see, the changes to the nutrition facts label, the nutrition facts panel are meant to reflect current science. And another example of this is reflected in the most recent change in which the calorie count was made to be bigger and bolder on the label. And this was to reflect the rise in obesity between 2000 and 2018, which saw the prevalency of obesity increase almost 12% during that time. And added sugars was included on food labels in an attempt to decrease consumption of added sugars and bring it closer to recommendations that it be less than 10% of total calories. Recent data had shown that intake was about 13%. And there've been changes to vitamins and nutrients um, that are required to be listed, again, to reflect current habits and current science. So vitamin D replaced vitamins A and C because of concerns about vitamin D deficiency. And potassium was added for the same reason. And as we know, potassium is, is important in the battle against high blood pressure. So you know, a lot of this data was, uh, was churned out and you know, the, the changes to the label were meant to reflect that. And the percent daily value was another important addition to the nutrition facts panel because it tells you how much of your daily need for a particular nutrient is contained in, in one serving. So I would say overall, the Nutrition Facts Panel has been successful and has worked very well. It helps consumers get information about food products at stores very quickly and conveniently and empowers them to make better choices for their families. You know, if you think about it, families are busy and, and a lot of times they get this information at the grocery stores. Not many folks have time to kind of study these study this information on, on websites before they go grocery shopping. So to have it handy and convenient when they're there um, is certainly very helpful. And also the label, you know, it's been modified, like I said, over the years to reflect current data and current science. And, and that makes it even more helpful for consumers. But, you know, that doesn't mean that changes can't be made. And, you know, we can build on this progress by ensuring consumers continue to have access to, to this information. And we do support uh, changes, specifically the Food Labeling Modernization Act that has been introduced in Congress. And that would re require the establishment of a single standard front of package nutrition labeling system in a timely manner for all food products required to bear nutrition labeling. And we'd also like to strengthen the current law to target trends in marketing that confuse or mislead consumers. Specifically, we'd like to see new guidelines for the use of the word healthy and natural. You know, those are terms that have yet to be defined uh, by the agency. So some, some more clarity for consumers on that front would be very helpful. And we'd like to see warning symbols for foods high in the types of nutrients that should be limited or discouraged, like sodium and added sugars, et cetera. 
So those are the, the uh, issues that we track. We track for consumer our members and write about in consumer reports. Um, again, it's you know overall this this program has been successful. It's very helpful to consumers. It's uh, it, it changes to to data, uh, but you know based on data and science. And again, we'd like to see improvements. You've also seen it extended to things like menu labeling. Um, we'd also like to see it extended to, you know, food delivery systems, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera, uh, to have them list uh, this type of nutrient information as well. So that it continues to be Great. easily accessible for consumers. Thank you, Brian. Uh, and, and there's so many different uh, topics there that we'll come back to you from, uh, you know, how to weave in societal goals, um, the relationship between these labels, legislation and policy, uh, the, the pace of science and how that impacts things. And, and this issue you brought up around uh, confusion and how industry may in fact try to capitalize on confusion on occasion. Uh, so we'll kind of come back to some of those. Um, next up, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Quinta Warren, um, who is Associate Director of Sustainability Policy also at uh, Consumer Reports. Um, if you look at the details of her bio, a lot of amazing things there as well, uh, has worked on uh, accelerating entrepreneurial ventures in Africa, um, and has a PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Got that one out this morning. Uh, so thank you, uh, Dr. Warren. Uh, give us a, a, a few thoughts from, from yourself. Thank you, Justin, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, so you've all heard my name, it's Quinta Warren, um, and I am the Associate Director of Sustainability Policy at Consumer Reports. Um, as Justin said, I'm a chemical engineer by training, and I've worked in the energy sector for over a decade on multiple things, including carbon management, power generation, and energy policy work with the Department of Energy and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Here at Consumer Reports, I am helping to advocate for policies that benefit the consumer in many ways, including in terms of um, increased uh, cost savings and reduced energy use. Um, as an example, we're currently analyzing and providing public testimony on the proposed car rulings that have been put forth, put forth by the EPA and the Department of Transportation. So jumping into this particular topic on labeling, um, sustainability in the energy sector I would say primarily relates to reduced energy consumption and increased energy efficiency. Um, so residential energy consumption in the US accounts for about 21% of national energy consumption. 55% um, of that is from heating and cooling and about 45% of that from heating water, um, appliances, electronics, and lighting. Um, the point of all of that is to say that we tend to use a lot of energy at home and reducing energy use will um, greatly benefit us in terms of savings and um, um, reducing any um, greenhouse gas emissions related to energy generation. So this also in turn, so reducing energy use, as I said, re relates also to lower energy bills for the consumer. Um, there are several energy performance labels that um, I, I would like to mention today. The first is Energy Star, which uses rigorous criteria to, to denote um, energy performance and water usage. And it's um, managed by the EPA and the DOE. Energy Guide as well looks at yearly operating costs and for appliances and models that are also in the in a similar range as the appliance you're looking at. We have the window stickers on cars that primarily denote fuel economy and that help you know consumers that are buying cars to judge whether or not um, those cars match the, the fuel efficiency that they're looking for. And then I should also mention that Consumer Reports has the green choice designation or badge which looks at which they give out to the top 20% um, of cars that have the cleanest emissions and also um, washing machines that are ranked in terms of water and energy efficiency. Another point I'd like to make is that consumers need good information in order to make decisions. And that's a fundamental for any well-functioning market. The labels need to be trustworthy. They need to be accurate. They need to be easy to understand but labels are just one piece of the puzzle. Um, they can't replace strong consumer protections. 
So we could have a lot of really well labeled but bad choices, and that would be the same as no choice at all. Um, as an example, for fuel economy choices, um, we find that those are quite limited in the market because about two thirds of all car models are actually within five miles per gallon of the model average. And for trucks, they're also nearly two thirds um, get within three miles per gallon of the model average. So even though we have these energy labels, we need to keep fighting to bump up you know, the efficiency standards so that you know, we can help to protect the consumer. So those are my opening thoughts. Thank you, uh, Quinta. We're going to uh, go next to uh, Kyle, um, and Kyle Wines is, is CEO of iFixit, um, and he is an expert in design for repair, uh, everything from uh, service documentation on through to uh, thinking through, you know, how to make some of these policies work that allow us to uh, tinker with the things that we buy. Um, and I think we have him to uh, thank for the fact that we can repair our own tractors in some cases, as well as that we can jailbreak uh, tablets and cell phones. Um, so Kyle, uh, welcome. And I understand you'll have a slide to show us as well. I do, absolutely. Uh, yeah, excited to be here. And I mean, as I think about the success of labels in general, um, uh, I can't think of two more successful labels than the Nutrition Label and the Energy Star Label. Uh, they impact consumer choices. They impact our um, uh, my purchasing all the time. I, we got a bottle of non-alcoholic wine last week and it had a nutrition label on it. And it was like, what? This is so interesting. I've never seen a nutrition label on a bottle of wine before. Um, and I kind of wish that that extended to all alcohol. It, it would be cool. Like how many calories are in this bottle of beer? I have no idea. <laughs> so that would be nice. Um, so if you think about all of the durable goods that we buy, whether it's a smartphone or a vacuum, we don't have information on how long they're going to last. Um, and so for, with something like a vacuum, energy efficiency of that vacuum might matter, but what matters a lot more to consumers is, is it going to last for the warranty plus one day? <laughs> Am I going to be replacing this vacuum in 13 months because, you know, some little clicky plastic piece broke? Uh, or is it going to be something that will last me for 10 or 15 years? Uh, and with appliances in, in general, uh, you know, they used to last, it used to be you buy a refrigerator and you'd have it for uh, you know, 20 years. Uh, now, the average lifespan of appliances is around seven years, um, and uh, the UK Consumer Agency switched to the survey of consumers asking, like, how do you feel about the life expectancy of your products? And 70% of consumers were dissatisfied with how long their durable goods were lasting. So uh, we need to look at, at increasing durability of these things, and, 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 and repairability is, is really the main factor, because these products are increasingly complex. There's different things that could break. Uh, can you get parts when they break? Uh, with vacuums, usually it's the power switch that breaks. It's like a little spring or a little plastic thing. Why are we throwing away an entire vacuum because of a $2 part? Uh, so iFixit has been rating products based on repairability for over a decade. If you're not familiar with iFixit, we're the online free repair community for everything. We help about 10 million consumers a month around the world learn how to fix things. Uh, and it's everything from vacuums to smartphones to you name it, any product that you'd like, uh, we have free uh, repair guides. Uh, kind of like Wikipedia for fixing things. Uh, and, and as part of our work, we rate products on an iFixit scoring system. Uh, and this, this slide that I'm showing you uh, is the new French uh, scoring system that is kind of an evolution of our work. Uh, I would assume that no one on this call has ever heard of this French repairability label before. <laughs> uh, uh, we're, this is a new America call. Uh, but uh, this label rolled out in France January 1. This is a mandatory label for uh, five categories of products, including washing machines, smartphones, laptops, and a few other categories of products. Um, and this score, you can see, I mean, very user-friendly. You look, oh, it's got a light yellow label on the shelf. Okay. I've got an idea that maybe I'm going to have trouble getting parts. Um, this label is mandatory. If you go to apple.fr and you try to buy an iPhone, you will see the iPhone gets a yellow label of five out of 10 on this scorecard. Um, and uh, this, the stats that I'm showing you here, Samsung commissioned a survey looking at what were consumer perceptions in France with this new uh, label. You know, we're sitting here in October. It's been on shelves since January. And you can see it's really had a market impact. Um, this is important. You, you kind of step back and say, well, 
what's the broad trajectory of society? What does it do to these products when consumers have the choice? Because right now, consumers don't have the choice to pick. You, know, you go to buy a vacuum and there's a $100 vacuum and there's a $200 vacuum. Which one do I pick? If you knew that the $200 vacuum was gonna last four times as long as the $100 one, you might be more inclined to buy that. Uh, but because consumers don't have that information, they buy the $100 vacuum. And that has driven prices down, that's driven manufacturers to create cheaper and shorter lasting products. Uh, and we have this kind of vicious cycle where consumers want better products, but don't know how to pick them. Manufacturers are not incentivized for creating better products. Um, and so we have kind of a, a world of disposability. Uh, if we look at iFixit scores, uh, where we have rated products, uh, electronic products for repairability over the last decade, uh, every single year, the average score across the industry goes down. Things are getting less and less repairable. Uh, there is less parts available. It used to be for any vacuum, you could get a part for, from the manufacturer. Now it's increasingly challenging. Um, so we're really optimistic that this French repairability label is going to change things around. Um, this is not just France. Uh, Spain has announced that they're going to adopt this repairability label. I've heard that Chile is looking at doing the same thing. And then the European Commission has said that, they, and, uh, that they're going to adopt something like this Europe-wide, uh, and the European Joint Research Center is working on this. Uh, we have also gotten inquiries from a number of U.S. Uh, state houses looking uh, to implement maybe a U.S. state-level uh, repairability label as we wait for Congress to do things. Um, so there is a lot of momentum for this in the broader context of right to repair. This is a piece of information that consumers just have no idea. Um, so I would leave you with one thought. If you're like, I wish this label was here now. How do I pick? I have to buy a vacuum tomorrow. Um, the easiest thing to do is to search online. If there's a thing you're thinking about buying, look and see if you can buy replacement parts for it. If there's no way to get a replacement part, if there's no way to get that on switch for the vacuum, uh, then it's a disposable product. Uh, and, and this is something that we're excited. We're discussing with Consumer Reports and other folks. How can we integrate product longevity, availability of parts, availability of information into some of the existing consumer scorecards that are out there? Thank you, Kyle. And uh, while we wait for, for, for Congress to, to, to act is a, uh, a, loaded, a loaded phrase, <laughs> uh, which we'll maybe uh, delve into a little bit. So let, let me just kind of, I'll, I'll pick up on a couple of things. Um, and by the way, I'll just urge our, our viewers, if you have questions to, to share those in, uh, and we'll make sure to try to address those. But you know, one of the things that it, it feels like it's sort of first thing to ask is um, from your perspectives, what is different about trying to label tech uh, versus trying to label food or uh, you know energy sustainability or, or other things? I mean, I, I suppose I suppose sustainability uh, lead certifications, things of that nature, may be closer to some tech products, um, but there might be some significant differences as well. What what are the unique challenges to to tech as a a, a category or sector of things to to label? And maybe, I don't know, uh, Quinto or Brian, if, if you've thought about this at all, uh, but Kyle, I can start with you. Uh, yeah, we, there are some existing eco labels for electronics, and I, I didn't talk about them, honestly, because I'm really unhappy with all of them. Uh, I would say what's different about tech is the tech industry is very savvy about this, and there's a large amount of regulatory capture happening inside the existing green uh, environmental labels. So the most common one, the one that's used by the federal government is called EPEAT, and it's a family of, of uh, technical standards. Initially, it was successful at, at doing things like getting post-consumer plastic into the process, but uh, the manufacturers are very savvy and were able to manipulate the process to completely water down those standards and make them meaningless, uh, which is why we've had a, de a decade of kind of the science being in that repairability and product life extension was where we needed to go and absolute stasis and no progress on this in any of the green standards. So I would say what's different about tech is that the lobbyists are really, really good uh, and have stymied progress. Brian, from your perspective, you talked about this a little bit, the idea that industry can kind of uh, get its, uh, sink its teeth in and create confusion and, and kind of capitalize on that. Um, how, do, how do you avoid that in, in the process? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point, Justin. And first of all, to answer Kyle's question about the bottle of wine and nutrition information, uh, the reason why alcohol doesn't have nutrition information is because it's regulated by a different industry uh, agency. Uh, FD, so it's regulated by the Alcohol uh, and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau. So 
and we want to talk about powerful lobbies that prevent certain progress being made. I, I think that's certainly uh, the case uh, there as well. But yeah, I mean, overall, the, the, you know, the burden has always been on the consumer. <laughs> Have you ever seen that before? <laughs> Not on a wine bottle. That's terrific. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think Justin, the to Kyle's point, the burden has always been on the consumer to get this type of information, whether it's a food product, whether it's tech, whether it's automobiles, et cetera. And the industry counts on that. They, they count on the consumer not having enough time, enough resources to really dive in depth into these products and get the information that's needed. You know, I brought up this example of, you know, the, the serving size. They certainly... Uh, it was nothing that they did, but they explicitly, but certainly something that they facilitated, encouraged in terms of uh, misleading on, on serving size. So, you know, you know, that's why we exist in this realm is to try to process all of that information and provide consumers with really convenient, up-to-date information so that they can make those better choices. Quinta, anything from your end on, on this topic of, of industry uh, engagement with the process and, and where that can go wrong, how it can go right? Yeah, I guess I, I'll start by saying, you know, the information that goes into the labels needs to be um, repeatable, reproducible. And so that adds an, an added, that gives an added layer of complexity to the process. Because just because you can do something in a lab doesn't mean it necessarily translates into the real world. And yet you can't do it under every single condition in the lab. So that's that's the first thing is that, you know, sometimes the information that or the tests that go into these labels are not 100% representative of the real world. And that can appear like a deception, but it's really not. It's more about um, reproducibility at least from the standpoint of the, let's say the agencies that are um, responsible for this. So consumers in real life might find, for instance, that their fuel efficiency is slightly different from what they would read on, on a label whose information comes from EPA tests, for instance. And it's slightly different because, you know, maybe you're in rush hour traffic all the time versus driving, you know, on a highway that's not congested. Um, but having said that, yes, um, sometimes industry can be, um, let's say, misleading in, in the way that they present their products because they understand how the tests are run. And sometimes they will take advantage of that and they will beef up their numbers to look really good. And then the consumers become concerned because they read the, the labels and they see a number. And when they drive the car in real life, that's not really the average number that they're seeing. An example of that is the scandal that we had with um, Volkswagen because they were manipulating the fuel efficiency tests. And you know, fortunately we have organizations like Consumer Reports and other advocacy organizations that keep a close eye and um, try to make sure that in fact, what we're seeing presented by, by industry is what's really happening. And if that's not the case, then you know, we have we have the opportunity to try to correct that by either, you know, going to the EPA or you know, filing suits or whatever we need to do to protect the consumer. So I don't know quite how to I put this question, but I'm kind of wondering about the the interaction of of, of the science um, with the with the labeling pro labeling process. Um, and this may be a naive and incorrect assumption, but on some level, Kyle, it kind of occurred to me coming into this that. You know, maybe some of this stuff, whether it's, uh, you know, the label on the on this particular panel talks about broadband and IoT, for instance, on some level, maybe some of that stuff's moving a little faster than food science. Um, maybe that's wrong, by the way, Brian will correct me. Um, is there, you know, how does the kind of pacing of the science play into labeling and what we know about the products and how they work? Yeah, we're always seeing uh, new things. I mean, I make a living selling tools, uh, and we're always developing tools for the newest, uh, the newest gizmos. So yeah, there is definitely a pace 
Uh, but fundamentally, whether it's a automobile or a vacuum or a phone that you're going to be, you know, removing screws to open it, right? Availability of information is the same across all products. Availability of parts is, is the same. Um, so it's really more of an ecosystem challenge. Uh, are, you, are you planning and providing for an ecosystem? Are you thinking about the product over the course of many years, a decade? If you can't get security updates for a phone, uh, two years after it's made, then is there a plan? Was there ever a plan for that phone to last longer than two years? Um, so I think that the it's it's new, uh, but I don't think it's changing at a pace that that regulators can't can't match. Um, yeah, we'll be behind a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, Brian or Quinta, what about when a label goes wrong? Um, how, how hard is it to kind of step back and, and, and fix things after the fact? I mean, it's, you know, a lot of work can go into these, but of course, you know, once it's in, in practice, I'm sure that there are uh, changes that need to be made on occasion. And I'm sure occasionally there are mistakes that may, you know, really impact the way consumers behave. Brian, maybe I'll put that one to you. Let me find the unmute button. Yeah, I, it, that's an interesting point. I, I think a lot of the examples that we've seen on the food side in terms of labeling gone wrong is unrelated to nutri nutrition facts, although I'm, I'm sure there's some cases now that I say that, but just in terms of the label claims that are made on some of these outside of the nutrition facts panel, like healthy, natural, good for you, health, heart healthy, things like that. Um, where you've encountered products at stores, like, is this really heart healthy? And then come to find out later when there's a more in-depth analysis conducted, it's, it may not be as, as healthy as we would like, or it's been misrepresented in some ways. And that, and that certainly causes some consternation among consumers uh, in that, can we really trust any of the labels? Like, it's easy, I think, for consumers to make these sweeping generalizations that once they distrust the label and encounter a situation where it's been proven incorrect, then that impacts buying behavior for other products. Like, well, you know, it, I don't believe in the heart healthy, you know, good for you, et cetera, type labels. So, no, I, I think that's an excellent point in that that's what kind of impact an incorrect label can have long term on consumer buying habits is you, you tend not to trust similar labels on other products. Quinta, do you see this in, in your domain? Yeah, actually, I think it's just a normal, I don't think it's unusual for, for most labels to um, evolve over time. Um, I, I want to say that normally um, there's good intention behind setting up the labels, right? It's to provide information that consumers can use to judge which products to buy but the implementation of it is, you know, sometimes where the, the issues come in. I mean, I, I mentioned the EPA um, because of Energy Star. Um, so Energy Star is mandatory, right, for, for appliances. And um, there are certified tests that the EPA has set up in conjunction with DOE. And, and so these things are in place, but over time, um, we've had to go back to these agencies and say, um, the, the tests that you guys are running are not quite right. Um, and here's why, here are the loopholes that you inadvertently allowed um, in these tests. So I think there's, there's always room for improvement. And over time, we found that generally the, the agencies are responsive, right? It might take some time to fix, but um, things can be um, refined. The labels can be refined and, and they, they do tend to get better and better over time. Um, it's, it's obviously a different issue if, if companies are being disingenuous and they're deliberately exploiting those loopholes. But again, um, that's why it's important for consumer reports and organizations like, like us to, to keep paying attention and, and trying to make sure that we close those loopholes. Hal, in our, our, our pre-conversation, we talked a little bit about the idea of, uh, you know, regulatory capture, um, you know, how, and you just mentioned, you know, of course, how the active the lobbyists are uh, on behalf of the, the tech industry. Um, what can advocates do to kind of get around that uh, or to, you know, try to kind of uh, keep things on the uh, up and up? Well, if, if you want to get involved in electronic standards, uh, you can join the technical committee. There's, there's uh, actually no bar. Um, consumers can just join and participate. 
Um, uh, and then you can watch what I've been seeing. Uh, but I would say, I mean, one of the, the main challenges has been there's kind of no funding to participate in these processes from a uh, sort of consumer agency side of things. Um, and so if if consumer reports or I fix it doesn't engage, like who else is going to represent consumers? Um, uh, and so we've seen over time, uh, one of the strategies the manufacturers have is to make the process as complicated and time consuming in terms of like literally years as possible, because who can dedicate, you know, two hours a week for the next three years to work on a, on a standard. Uh, uh, you kind of have to have someone paying you to do that. It's very hard to do that on a volunteer basis. Um, so we don't have kind of systems and processes in place. This is an area where I would say the EU is better set up for this because the consumer agencies get government funding to engage in this kind of work. Uh, and a lot of the repairability research that we have done, uh, we have a European uh, subsidiary and we've uh, been able to get a number of grants from the European Commission to do and kind of advance and push this work forward. Uh, and I think that's why you're seeing this label is, is uh, you know, in place in France and coming coming soon in Europe. And you're also seeing discussion about you know, requirements on security updates and standardized ports. Um, so that's the kind of fundamental, I, I think, research and, and sort of work that has to happen to counter the, the manufacturers. Quinta, Brian, are there things that you admire about, about the European approach? I'll let you go first, Quinta. Um, to be frank, I've not been following the European approach that closely. I mean, just based on what Kyle is saying, of course, this is, it, it does seem promising. I really like that um, iFixit has been able to roll out this um, fixability index, if, if you would call it that, because I, I do think that's something that's important. Um, I, I do know that on the energy side, the European, uh, the EU um, energy label um, I've, I've read reports in the past about how that that was a little confusing for consumers because of how the information was presented. And um, I've read with great pleasure that they've been paying attention to the complaints that um, people in the EU have had, and they are revising those labels. And I think they're rolling out the new labels as well. So um, from what I can see from a distance, they appear to be responsive to the consumers. So that's great. Yeah, on the food side, my focus is primarily on, on the domestic side as well. But I, I will say just in general, European rules, regulations tend to be more progressive, more consumer focused compared to the US. I think the dynamic that you see in the US where the, the industry holds a lot of sway, a lot of influence with policymakers, both on Capitol Hill and with the regulators. Um, on, on, the, on the other side of the Atlantic, that dynamic tends to be flipped. Um, as it relates to interactions and influence with with policymakers there, and you know, I, I certainly don't want to paint industry with a broad brush. I, I think, especially on the food side, there's certainly there's been a more concerted effort over the past several years of outreach to you know, consumer groups to build rapport, to hold meetings to just kind of establish those relationships more for information seeking and information exchange. So I think ultimately that's very productive and certainly the message from us to them is the more transparency that you can provide in these situations, the better um, and, and the more trusting consumers can be. Great. So we do have a couple of questions that have come in uh, from the audience. Uh, I want to thank you all for those and, and remind you that there's a little time for that. Um, uh, the, and some of them are, are, are somewhat specific, but I've got a couple of general ones. Um, you know, right now, I think, Kyle, this, you kind of got onto this a little bit, but what can we do to push for improved labels? Um, and then how do we manage uh, expectations? Clearly, that last one from uh, Nicholas Sa. Um, anybody got a, got a thought on that? Uh, maybe one or, one or the other of those questions. What can we do to push for improved level, labels? And how do you manage expectations clearly? I can start with just a couple of thoughts um, on the second question, how to manage expectations. I think, I think the, the onus lies on, on the people developing the labels to make them as simple to read, as easy to understand as possible. 
right? You're, you're, not, you're assuming that this is going out to everybody in the general public. So they don't need to be a scientist to understand this. They don't need to be, you know, um, over 21 to understand it. You really want people who are going out to shop to be able to, at a glance, tell what the information is that they're looking for. So, I mean, that requires a lot of different things, right? Maybe there are scales that we use, maybe there are color schemes that, that are easier to use, but I'm not sure that, well, I'm not sure where the, the question is coming, the, the asker is coming from when they say manage expectations because I think that the information should be presented and it should be presented in a way that's very easy to understand, accessible for everyone. Yeah, could you pull my slide up again? I'll show you some interesting things that the French did. Uh, and just kind of stepping back from the repair question, looking at how do you design a label in general, they did a lot of behavioral research. They actually created a bunch of prototypes of different uh, versions of the label. Um, and uh, so, that, you know, they settled on this, both a number and a color system. And what they found is they were rolling the label out. You had products on the shelf that didn't have the label next to products that did. Um, the average product is coming in right around a five. So the average product is yellow. And they found that a consumer <clears> looking <throat> at a product on the shelf that saw a product that was yellow and another product next to it that didn't have the label was picking the product that didn't have the label because they're like, well, yellow is bad. This one's probably going to be better. Um, and over time, as, as they've gotten more of these things on the shelf, we've seen we've seen uh, more, but um, they did a good job of, you know, making the, the label aggressive and giving headroom, giving opportunity for companies to improve. Um, so I, I would say, you know, what's, how do we, how do we get this to answer the first question? How do we get this kind of thing going, going in the U S uh, consumers need to demand it. Policymakers need to start working on, on uh, policies along those lines. We're working closely with consumer reports advocacy team on um, on right to repair laws. You had 27 different US states introduced right to repair laws so far this year. It wouldn't touch the labeling yet. It's kind of setting a baseline that then companies could improve upon. Uh, and, uh, and you have a bill in Congress right now. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission has announced that they're doing a big investigation into repair competition. Um, so there's a lot of momentum. There's a lot of opportunities to engage. If you want to get involved, you can drop me an email. I'm Kyle at iFixit, uh, and I'm happy to connect you with the coalition uh, because we absolutely need help. Uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of momentum right now, but we haven't gotten anything across the finish line yet. Great. Um, I've got a couple of questions here that are that are sort of specific, and, and they might be uh, maybe slightly more for Kyle, given that they're about electronics, but uh, anyone else can jump in. The first is, will CU add replacement parts availability to product ratings? I can't answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, mean, uh, I would just say we're, we're having the conversation, but I don't think anyone at Consumer Reports is going <laughs> to. Uh, it, it would sure be a great thing to do, though. Cool. Okay, well, uh, that question will hang out there then, one that we'll follow up on, uh, follow up on after the fact, I'm sure. Um, and then a more specific question uh, from an anonymous uh, asker, uh, what labels should smart devices such as TVs that require external services require? I have a perspective, but do either of you wanna weigh in first? Uh, it looks like that's in your wheelhouse, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it's, it's one of the things that's frustrating with a TV in particular is you cannot buy a TV on the market these days that is not a smart TV. And, um, uh, you may not realize this, but the TV manufacturers are oftentimes losing money selling you a TV and they make up the money by selling your watching data. So that's like a tracking pixel on your TV and the, it used to be Nielsen ratings. Well, now, uh, you know, the, the TV manufacturers are selling what you're watching, um, and, and, and then also injecting ads and everything else. So um, I think there ought to be some disclosures around that. Uh, personally, I will never ever give a TV my Wi-Fi password. Just don't connect your TV to the internet, period. Uh, because the, the lack of security updates for these things is major. Um, and this is the case across all smart appliances. If you go to LG's website, they say that you should check uh, for security updates for LG refrigerators every other month. Um, so I'd like everyone on the call here to think about the last time you looked for a security patch for your refrigerator. 
Uh, this is the case across all Internet of Things devices. So manufacturers should be disclosing, like, does the device have, have Internet connectivity? Can you shut off uh, that, that Internet connectivity? How long are they committing to make security patches for? Um, is this thing secure to connect to your network? Um, and, and then, you know, in the case of, of something like, okay, cool, you've built Netflix app into the TV, great. How long are you going to support that for? If Netflix changes their login system three years from now, is your TV going to be obsolete? And you have to replace a whole fully functional TV just because of software obsolescence. Um, and then also, of course, parts and tools and that kind of thing. So, I mean, this, uh, maybe just stay with us for a minute, Brian, uh, Quinta, if you have any kind of reflections on that from your perspective, uh, looking at other sectors in particular. But, you know, I think one thing that is different, of course, from um, maybe, maybe most food products uh, and the types of devices that you just described is that, you know, once you purchase the thing and take it home, you don't Im imagine generally that the manufacturer is going to, you know, um, silently slip by and, and change the, the dang thing, um, you know, under your nose, which seems to be what Kyle's describing. So I don't know, I mean, is, the, the, is there any kind of corollary in other labeling regimes to, uh, you know, how to avoid um, the confusion that could come from that? And I think the common thread in all of this is, you know, to, to Kyle's point earlier too, just consumer engagement. I mean, again, it just speaks to the burden that is placed on, on consumers in, in knowing what goes into these products, food, electronics, automobiles, et cetera. I mean, some of this information that Kyle just alluded to, I, I think it, it certainly was a surprise to me in some respect, in terms of the smart TVs, it, it's certainly going to impact my, you know, abilities or, or my reasons to to purchase certain TVs. Um, you know, why, you know, isn't that information, you know, readily available to consumers and easy to process, easy to digest, so to speak, uh, you know, from a food perspective? Uh, it, it just, you know, the, the burden is always going to be on the consumer to find out more information to to get more transparency from industry and making sure that they're making the right choices. And it's it's unfortunate because, you know, a lot of us just don't have the time to devote, to you know, to resources, to to look into this information, to, to find out all of the pertinent information. Um, it, and it, it just makes it that much more difficult and it, it makes all of us, you know, our work that much more important. Yeah, one thing I can add is um, in the past, CR has, well, we, we do, you know, constant consumer survey research and past research shows that ads on TV tend to, well, ads in general tend to emphasize for cars emotion over things like fuel economy. And in particular, the, the research I'm thinking about showed that only 15% of auto buyers reported learning fuel economy information from advertising. And then about 23% of all current vehicle owners, um, for them, the window sticker was the only source of mileage information. So, you know, there it is. <laughs> so so um, one thing I wanted to kind of uh, touch on as well, uh, may, which, which may, uh, you know, uh, come back to that on some level, Quinta. Uh, Brian mentioned uh, questionable terms, and, and when those show up in labels, things like uh, heart healthy or organic that can be, you know, really ambiguous or um, you taken advantage of. Um, I guess to some extent, I'll ask across the board, but maybe starting with Kyle, are there are there terms like that in in the in the tech space generally with appliances and other uh, technology products that you think of as the equivalent to organic or heart healthy? Uh, ones that leave the door open for for lots of interpretation. A uh, great question. I actually don't think so. I know it's a major problem with with food. I can't really think of one. I mean, I I would say it's just really about like length of of updates. Uh, which the really there's this is all lies by omission, uh, rather than uh, twisting words like I know that we see a lot in the in the food realm. Uh, good question. I will think about that. And Justin, just to clarify real quick, um, you know, uh, I think the two the two biggest labels that uh, from the food perspective that tend to be misleading, confusing, et cetera, is, is um, healthy and natural. Uh, I just want to clarify that typically organic is doesn't really fall into that category just because there are some clear standards 
that manufacturers have to follow in order to be deemed organic. So just want to make sure that that we put that clarification Absolutely. out there so we don't get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't wanna don't wanna introduce yeah. <laughs> uh, disinformation into the right. into the an already complex topic. Um, exactly. So uh, another question that is uh, around a specific technology as Alexa and Google Assistant are added to cars and other major products, will they still work if we turn off Alexa and Google Assistant? So are we are we looking at a world where um, we can't tell Apple and Google no in the future? And I guess this is also another question that gets to the complexity of the uh, inter interoperable nature of some of these products and services or the, you know, importance. I mean, I have a problem like that with my car, which, you know, uh, no longer seems to, to work with any modern Bluetooth devices for whatever reason, even though it, it did perfectly well five years ago. Yeah, this is uh, very relevant. And this is actually the topic of a ballot initiative that passed in Massachusetts last year. Um, that so you have when when a car is talking over the wireless cellular network to the manufacturer or to Alexa or whatever that that's called uh, telematics and the manufacturers were increasingly moving the access to repair information from uh, wired you know you plug in your, your mechanic would plug in a, a, a physical tool into the car now it's passing your your information on whether you need an oil change uh, to the manufacturer directly over the cellular network. And the Massachusetts law says that manufacturers have to give uh, consumers and independent repair shops access to that information. Um, you could also imagine maybe the ability to turn it off would be nice, right? Do I want Ford and GM to know where my car is at all times? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Uh, I, I should have that choice. Uh, sa same thing is happening uh, with farmers. Uh, all these new modern tractors have cellular modems on them and they're communicating. They're sending John Deere the data, the tillage data on your farm. Do you want John Deere to have that data? They have a pretty cozy relationship with Monsanto who's selling me seeds. Maybe I don't want Monsanto to have that information. Uh, so we've been talking to farmers and teaching them how to remove the SIM card from their tractor. Uh, so I think these are all very relevant conversations, um, and you have to assume that the pace and speed of technological change is going to be much faster than the pace that you're going to replace your car or refrigerator. Um, so the ability to kind of opt out of these internet connected ecosystems, uh, and in the case of your car, does your car have a headphone jack? That sounds like a great way to bypass Bluetooth. <laughs> um, go, these tried and true technologies are always going to uh, be more resilient than whatever the current hot, shiny, you know, integration is. I'll have to go and look for that uh, headphone jack. Um, so I've got a, a question here as well uh, about, you know, items, qualities, features, including uh, in, included in labels and, and when they've been updated. This one, I think, really for Quinta and Brian, are there new things or requirements you think should be added to update food and energy labeling systems at the moment? Things that would really improve food or, or energy labeling systems uh, right now. And Brian, maybe I'll start with you. Sure. I, I think what... What could really improve labeling for food it are clear definitions for natural and healthy, like, like I'd indicated earlier. And, and also, you know, just going back to the slide that, that, that Kyle showed just in terms of how the information was presented in the EU, you know, something similar for food would be very helpful too. Just a very clear upfront symbol, front of pack that, that gives some clarity, some clear indication to a consumer of, of health, of, of what have you, that so that the consumer can just process the information immediately as opposed to trying to review the nutrition facts panel or, or you know go on a website to, to do more research there. So I, I think those are the are the are the biggest items right now. You know, just you know more clarity on menu labeling too. You know, that's a law that went into effect uh, this past decade and and you know, there's still some work that, that needs to be done there to kind of make that information more available and more clear to consumers. Um, and, and again, the food delivery apps, that's, that's another area where there's some obfuscation going on in terms of who you know, is responsible for pr providing that information, but it's clear that it has to be made available in some respect to the consumer. Yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. You know, so many people these days are getting their food from uh, either delivery or from you know, services that, that send them uh, ingredients already ready made. Um, and, and, you know, that seems to bypass most of the, the types of labels that you're talking about. 
No, that's absolutely right. And I think to Kyle's point too, is that there's always gonna be a little bit of a lag between you know, what the existing technology is happening now and then you know, consumer response and also more importantly, how regulators respond. Um, you know, and you've seen this play out with food labeling in that the, the nutrition facts panel was a culmination of decades of work that went into it um, about the availability of this information. And so you've seen this play out with other aspects of that as well. Quinta, anything from you? Yeah, you know, I, again, I agree with Kyle and Brian. Awareness, education of the consumer is really important because you can put these labels out, but do people really understand what they mean? Um, in the energy sector, it's, it can be easy because energy consumption, energy efficiency, those can be boiled down into how much money it takes to operate an appliance over a year, for instance. So you can, you can put all of that information, but as long as you have the money, um, the cost, then the consumer is able to compare products and say, well, this cost me $200 a year, this cost me $10 a year. I mean, I like, this one looks better, but maybe I want to spend less, you know. So that part is easy, but um, there is also, there are also things like um, greenhouse gas emissions that are associated with products. And so that's something that consumers are certainly very interested in, but it's really complicated um, to, to get that data and, and to present it. Um, again, this opens up you know, opportunities for, for companies to become, to be disingenuous in how they present that information. So if I, if I have a product in my hand, a cell phone, for instance, or um, an appliance, um, am I going to look at the greenhouse gas emissions that it took to manufacture it? What about the greenhouse gas emissions that went into getting the materials that went into manufacturing it? Um, and then, you know, let's, um, operating is another, another, you know, set of emissions. And so do we add all of that up? Do we consider, you know, what happens when you discard the product? So I'm happy to say this is something that Consumer Reports is interested in and we're looking at. It's not an easy question to answer, but it's something that we need to pay attention to. But if, if we put these labels in place, then they just need to be done in a way that is unambiguous, um, is easy to explain, easy to understand, and takes into account um, all the greenhouse gas emissions that go into making, shipping, and operating the product so that people can really make um, well-informed decisions. Well, we've had a, a wide-ranging discussion uh, about the uh, possibilities with labels, uh, the challenges, the uh, opportunities, and I certainly know a lot more about uh, them than I did when I started this as, as a mere consumer, not as an expert like the three of you, so I appreciate it very much. Um, just really quickly, uh, Brian, Quinta, Kyle, is there a place where folks can find out more about your work or follow you? Yes, uh, sign up for our Consumer Reports Food Advocacy uh, Newsletter and the Consumer Reports Advocacy website. It, it's separate from the main Consumer Reports website and it tracks all of the, the policy issues that we follow uh, for policymakers. Great. Quinta? And, uh, yeah, just to add to that, I mean, we work at the same company, so nothing new there. <laughs> but I will also say that we, uh, you know, a lot of our members are very interested in getting involved in the advocacy process. And so as we are following proposed rulings, um, we do give it, our members the opportunity to, to, to be a part of that process in either signing petitions or, you know, we, we provide information for them if they want to sign up and give public testimony as well. So it's a really good idea to to sign up and follow um, our newsletters so that they can be alerted when those opportunities come up. And Kyle. Yeah, paylifexit.com and you can sign up for our newsletter. There's lots going on. Um, I'm Kay Weens on Twitter, uh, but also uh, the Repair Coalition is repair.org. Uh, and if you wanna get involved in Right to Repair and see some of uh, the the laws that are happening, we're expecting a lot of uh, motion to happen on these right to repair laws starting in January when the state legislatures get back in the session. Um, there's a lot of momentum, there's support from the Biden administration, there's support from the Federal Trade Commission, uh, and, and so everyone's going to be focused on the state houses this next year. Excellent. Uh, well, I think we've reached the end of our hour. It's time for me to turn things back over to Andy. I want to thank our panel. Thank you to Brian, to Quinta, to Kyle. I know Kyle has uh, already got a, uh, a drink at the ready uh, there with a bottle of wine nearby. So 
uh, you all can congratulate yourselves for an excellent it's, uh, mid, it's midday panel. Calories for serving a wine. Did you know that? I didn't. N- know that. Nothing to worry about, right? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, everybody. Andy, I'll turn it back over to you and thank you all so much. Thank you, everyone. It was great to hear about the work that you're doing. Uh, and I'm going to actually pass it on to our next panel, which is talking about some future labeling systems that are in the works. Uh, so Jonathan Schwantes is a senior policy counsel at Consumer Reports, and he's going to kick off and introduce you to our second group. Great. Thanks, Andy. And thanks to Justin for moderating the first panel and to our um, excellent panelists who participated. I was actually quite pleased to hear some questions about um, connected cars and Alexa and Google Assistant and smart TVs. I actually do think it'd be nice to buy a dumb TV. Um, but anyway, all that is to say, we're going to take up some of those issues here in our second panel. A little bit about, a little bit first about who I am. My name is uh, John Schwantes. I'm a senior policy counsel in Consumer Reports Washington, D.C. office. Uh, for better or worse, I've spent my entire career in and around politics for 20 plus years. Uh, I started off and spent half of that in the Senate, on the Senate Judiciary Committee, where I served on the antitrust subcommittee, where I got fascinated with all of these tech and telecom issues. Um, at Consumer Reports, I am on the digital rights team, um, where my focus is on telecom and competition issues, but um, we work on a host of issues, including privacy, Internet of Things, algorithmic bias, and artificial intelligence, all of which I hope we will dig into here on panel two. So I kind of see that we're moving from old school, the nutrition facts, energy star, et cetera, to new school. So what will consumer labeling look like in the digital world? Um, what's the need? And how could labels help us uh, make better and more informed decision at the point of purchase? Um, we'll probably touch on the politics, which are, which are unique to the digital marketplace, or maybe not unique, and what industry is doing or failing to do to make better disclosures, whether that's something as simple as being transparent about how much your broadband bill will be each month. You think that would be simple, it's not. And to what data about you is being collected and how it's being used. And how long, for example, is a connected di- device you purchase how long will we be service and updated? Um, so let's kick off. We're going to move to introductions of the panelists, and then we'll tee up some opportunities um, here at the start for them to describe their work. I'm going to start with my friend, Sarah Morris. Sarah is the director at the New America's Open Technology Institute, or OTI, where they have been working on a consumer label for broadband service, aka a, uh, excuse me, a broadband nutrition label, for more than a decade. And I also know that OTI is collaborating with us here at CR on a sort of digital standard 2.0. Um, I don't have any, don't have much to do with that, Sarah. But um, can you tell us a little bit about a little bit more about you and uh, your work? Sure. Thanks so much, John. It's it's great to be. I'm really excited for this discussion. Um, and I'm excited to be able to talk about both the broadband nutrition label and the digital standard, but the broadband nutrition label in particular, because it's been um, something that I've worked on throughout my uh, long tenure at, at OTI. Um, so just by way of background, uh, the Open Technology Institute uh, is a program within New America that works at the intersection of technology and policy to ensure that every community has equitable access to gi- digital technology and its benefits. We promote universal access to communications technologies that are both open and secure, and we use a multidisciplinary approach that brings together advocates, researchers, organizers, and um, technologists. Um, And so our work spans a multitude of issues, everything from broadband access to data policies around privacy and algorithmic accountability, government surveillance, encryption, Um, and lots of issues uh, in between and adjacent to those um, that I mentioned. With our broadband access and adoption work, um, our goal is to make sure that everyone throughout the country has access to internet that is both robust and affordable. Um, And those two characteristics are are important to us. Um, As John knows, because we've been longtime partners and allies in this advocacy work, This is a complicated problem to solve. I think if it wasn't complicated, everyone knows how important internet access is and um, getting people, if getting people connected were easy, um, then we would just pull those levers and um, and make the change. And we are making progress, I think, but we we have a moment here to really um, uh, lean in to to closing the digital divide. Um, In addition to our advocacy work, OTI has done a report periodically um, called the cost of connectivity. And this report looks at um, 
the cost of uh, internet, we, we gather data on 760 internet plans across 28 cities in the US and around the world. Um, and it started out as a comparative analysis to see you know, where we stood vis-a-vis -vis Europe and uh, cities, uh, the cost of internet and the, the, the service in um, cities compared to the, from the US to cities abroad. Um, but what we found in our most recent report, which we put out last summer um, in 2020, um, was was less about the it, well, it was about the comparative cost and quality of service, but it was really about the the fact that internet in the U.S. is unaffordable um, for the vast majority for for, for many millions of people. Um, uh, the average cost uh, hovers around seventy dollars a month, and that's not even including the cost of internet after um, promotional rates expire and the rates go up, um, which we found to be as much as $22, $23 per month on average. Um, and so what this means is that, uh, and the other the other thing we found in our research is that it's really hard research to do. Uh, it's it's not, the, the information is not readily available. It's hard to compare services um, because different companies um, make different types of information available. And all of this reinforced something that we had um, intuitively known all along. Uh, which is which is we need some set of standardized um, user facing disclosures about the cost and quality um, characteristics of internet service, um, which is what we had proposed back in originally in 2009 with our broadband nutrition label. Um, and I think we have an example of the nutrition label handy if um, our production team from New America can put it up on the screen. Um, and so the idea here is that um, the broadband nutrition label would give uh, would be internet subscribers the ability to compare apples to apples. So to know um, and to know more granular detail about the cost of the service um, and the quality of the service, which might otherwise be obscured, um, things like promotional rates, uh, data caps, um, other charges uh, that aren't always apparent from the the monthly fee, um, and so you would. Uh, use the nutrition label to look across the available, assuming there's more than one provider in your area, which isn't always the case as we know, um, that you could look across the available services and make a more informed decision about um, uh, the, the internet that you're, to which you're subscribing. Um, and this is important. It's important because that's how an, effect, an effective competitive environment works, but it's also important because often, um, subscribers may come in under a promotional rate and then be uh, then experience significant sticker shock when that promotional rate runs out and not have clear recourse um, for how to navigate um, the, the information available to them to, to, to understand their work. And so we've been, so uh, thanks for, uh, to the New America folks, I think we can take down the label for now. Um, so that's been our work around the broadband um, nutrition label and, um, we think it's, and, and we've seen, we'll talk, I think a little bit about the state of play in the broader conversation, but we've been really um, uh, enthused to see a lot of interest in the broadband nutrition label. Again, it's been out in the world since in some form or other since 2009. Um, and, uh, uh, but in the past year or so, we've seen um, its inclusion in the Clyburn Klobuchar bill, the uh, Accessible and Affordable Internet for All Act. Um, the uh, recently, uh, the, the infrastructure package, uh, which we hope will pass soon. Um, we've seen it in an executive order from the president this summer on competition. And uh, there is a standalone bill from Representative Angie Craig out of Minnesota. Um, so we're seeing a lot of interest among policymakers. And I think the question now is how do we translate that into movement and momentum to make this type of label actually usable for, for, for users? Um, you also asked about the digital standard, which I'll just cover briefly here. Um, so the digital standard is not a label, but it's a collaborative uh, project that OTI has been working on with uh, Consumer Reports. It's a Consumer Reports um, led, led project. And it's really a framework to evaluate how um, technologies respect consumers' interests and needs. And so um, the way it works is it focuses on privacy, security, ownership, and governance of connected products at the top level. Um, and then for each of those areas, it lays out principles, then criteria, then indicators, and finally procedures to evaluate and enable structure or to enable structured evaluations by 
independent testing organizations, researchers, other product teams. So as I'm describing this, I think it becomes apparent that, that there is um, an opportunity to take where the digital standard is now and to think about how it might be utilized, not just by researchers and independent testers, but by um, consumers, by policymakers, by companies themselves. And I think that's where we kind of, um, although it's outside of this conversation strictly about labeling and um, consumer focus, pro focused um, uh, labels in the technology space, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there to think about how we connect the dots, particularly as we heard from the last panel in this world of IoT devices where um, not only is there a lack of information among consumers, there is this dynamic nature of the products themselves um, that are you know, shifting over time. So I will stop there and pass it on uh, back to you, John, to introduce the other panelists. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And as a fellow political junkie, I am excited to get into what is going on with our beloved label in Congress. Uh, but next up, we have Tasha Shimalinski. Tasha is the co-founder of the Data Nutrition, Pro Nutrition Project, an initiative that builds tools to mitigate bias in artificial intelligence. They are also a digital expert at McKinsey and Company and an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University. Previously, Kasha held positions at the US Digital Service in the White House and the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge, Massachusetts. When not in front of a computer, Kasha can be found leading a feminist bird watching event or cycling, cycling uncomfortably long distance, distances, but things I both love. Kasha, the floor is yours. Thank you, and uh, uh, I'm I'm honored to be on this panel. This kind of two part panel with all these great people. I'm learning a ton, actually. Um, so yeah, my name's Kasha. Um, I could talk about bird watching the whole time, but I won't. Uh, I am the co-founder of a group called the Data Nutrition Project, as as John said, uh, and I've been a product manager in industry as well, kind of simultaneously across a lot of different industries. So consumer, uh, government. I've been working in education, medical, and fintech. I'm basically quite old. Um, and um, you know, more more recently, focusing a lot on the Data Nutrition Project, which, um, as you mentioned, is a an organization, a research organization that builds tools for more responsible AI. Um, in in particular, I think relevant to this conversation, a nutrition label for data sets. So maybe it makes sense for me just to take a step back and just tell you a bit about how it came to be, um, and then I'll, I'll pass the the torch on here. Um, Essentially, a bunch of us came together, practitioners in the space, uh, also artists and policymakers, uh, for a fellowship that was jointly held between the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard and the MIT Media Lab in 2017. Um, so we all physically got together back in the old days, and we, you know, sat in a room without masks and talked a lot about things and shared snacks and things like that. And um, the, you know, the the target that we were given was to think about what we could do about the ethics and the governance of AI. And it was a few years ago, so it was a little bit more of a nascent space. And all of us who are kind of practitioners around the table, we decided to start with the data um, because we knew uh, the current situation, which is unfortunately still the current situation, uh, which is that there really aren't any data set standards. So if, if I'm given a task, you know, if I'm a data scientist or maybe an engineer at a company, a CEO comes to my desk one day and says, uh, I need to understand you know, how to target people for this advertising campaign. We have some internal data. Can you go find some data, demographic data, something so that we can build a model, get this out? And you're like, oh, sure. That sounds like an interesting uh, question. When's it due? And the CEO says Tuesday. You know, and you're like, oh, shoot. So, so what happens then is the data scientist like goes online and Googles a bunch of things and finds a bunch of data sets. And then there's no way to compare them. And there's no way to choose them. And there's no way to know whether or not that data is good for the use that you have. Um, and so as a group sitting around in a room in, at MIT, we said, hey, look, why don't we start here? When we think about the ethics uh, and the governance of AI, let's start with the data because um, it's that classic problem, right? Like garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you build on the data ends up picking up the traces of that data in the final model. So we're really focused on the output of models, but not so much about how they got there. And honestly, if you are catching issues once the model has been deployed, it's kind of too late. Because if you're at a big organization, they've put in a ton of you know, people, hours, and money, and resources. It's changed hands a dozen times. And you get to the end of it, and then it's remediation. You're just trying to figure out, how do we change the parameters or maybe switch the coefficients a little bit um, to make this a better model? As opposed to, if you know what it is your model is going to eat, before it even has started eating anything, then you can maybe change that diet so that it comes out different at the end. Um, and that's kind of the nutrition uh, analogy there. So we're sitting in this room and we thought, 
What if there was some way to tell what's in a data set before you eat it? Really, what if we had a nutrition label for a data set? And we knew that the analogy would break down in some cases. And, and I feel like the previous panel also had a lot of great things to say about the application of these kind of analog models to the digital world. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and we're going to touch on it here as well. I know Sarah was kind of touching on that too. Um, you know, so, so we thought, well, let's give it a try. And it was an academic fellowship. So we wrote a paper and we produced a prototype with ProPublica uh, on a medical data set. Uh, and then the fellowship ended. <laughs> and we kept getting inquiries about the paper that we wrote and the, and the prototype we built. And so we thought, well, you know what, there's so much interest and we're still interested in trying to solve this. Why don't we just spin this out into a company? And so it turned into a nonprofit and we're incorporated as a, as a research group. We put out a second version of the label um, in 21. Uh, actually, I think there's an image. If you want to uh, put that up, I can kind of talk to it for a second. Um, and, and the main difference here, so this, uh, let me give you like a very quick tour. Uh, this is a, um, a nutrition label for a data set that basically is a, a bunch of images, uh, tens of thousands of images, I believe, um, that does melanoma classification. So this came from Memorial Sloan Kettering and also a consortium called ISIC. Um, we worked with a doctor there, a dermatologist, who helped us understand the data set, uh, what's in it, what's not, how it should be used, how it shouldn't. And the way that this differs from the first version of the label, uh, which we published in 2018, is that it, it's really kind of centered around use case. So depending on what you're trying to do with the data, we try to tell you some things about how you should or should not proceed. Uh, so you can see the use cases on the right hand side. This data set would be you know, useful for identifying melanoma um, and uh, to predict um, you know, the incidence of melanoma in a population. Actually, that should not be a use case. So that's, that's this typo there on the old draft. Um, and then we have these kind of badges at a high level, which are kind of binary or just multivariate, but structured in a way to say, this is what it is and this is what it isn't. And we have these alert counts for potential harms or bias. Um, so you can take that down now. Um, don't want to clog up people's screens, but that's the that's the current version, and we're we're actually working on a third version now that's going to make it even faster to create and more um, obvious to read. Um, we're currently working with a number of tech companies, mostly on internal data sets, so proprietary data sets. So there's an interesting conversation there about how public these become, um, and also through a grant at Harvard to put these on open data sets uh, in their Dataverse, uh, which is the Harvard repository. Uh, and just to kind of summarize, right, the goal here is that there are not really any data set standards across domains uh, to do things like compare, especially for usage in algorithmic systems or algorithmic systems builds. So our goal is to drive a standard here. Uh, we believe the standard will drive better data usage. And also it will drive a culture change because there will be an expectation of seeing that label as a data scientist, much like when I walk into my bakery down the street and I see these like great pumpkin muffins that are now on sale because it's fall in New York and I want to know oh wait how like, what's actually in this muffin I have an expectation of a label even though it's not on the muffin because I've seen that in other places and we hope this drives the same kind of expectation for data sets so uh, happy to, to answer questions at some point but that's uh, an overview of, of what I'm working on I'm, I look forward to hearing about everyone else's Thank you, Kasha. That's already fascinated, and I'm excited to ask you some questions. Um, but our third panelist is Pardis Imami Naini. Pardis is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Washington, where she investigates tools and methods to empower people to make informed decisions about technology. Pardis obtained her PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. There, as part of her thesis, she led a series of projects on de to design security and privacy nutrition labels for consumer smart devices. Her work has been published at top venues in security and, and human computer, excuse me, human computer interaction and covered by multiple outlets, including Wired and the Wall Street Journal. Pardis, you're up. Awesome. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan, for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. Uh, as you just heard, I'm Pardis Amami Naini from University of Washington. Okay, uh, so let me tell you a bit about our research on IoT security and privacy labels. About four years ago, together with my colleagues at the School of Computer Science at Carnegie Mellon University, we started a series of projects to design a usable and informative security and privacy label for consumer smart devices. We initially got interested in labeling smart devices after we realized that many consumers currently are not able to make an informed purchase decision, mainly due to lack of readily available information about the security and privacy of smart devices at the time of purchase. 
This motivates us to uh, design a nutrition-like label for IoT devices that convey the most critical security and privacy information of smart devices in an understandable and usable format. We next invited a diverse group of privacy and security experts from industry, academia, government agencies, and nonprofits to help us specify the most important information that consumers should know about when purchasing a smart device. And based on the experts' input, we considered about 47 security, privacy, and general factors and designed a layered label with two layers. Uh, can you please have the label uh, on the screen, please? Awesome, thank you. Okay, so the primary layer is the concise format of the label, which could be printed and attached to the package of the smart device. And then there is a QR code and URL at the bottom that direct consumers to the secondary layer where they can find more detailed information about the security and privacy practices of the smart device. Uh, after talking to experts, we then conducted a series of studies with consumers of IoT devices to improve the usability and risk communication of our label. And uh, the one that you see on the screen here is the final version of our label. In addition to this label, we created a specification document for users and device manufacturers to understand each field of this label. Moreover, we developed a tool to uh, generate the labels. Basically, user can fill out a form for different sections of the label and then see the label being generated in real time. And we are now looking for device manufacturers to pilot our labels on real smart devices to carefully investigate the efficacy of such labels in informing IoT consumers' purchase behavior. Uh, that was a very short summary of uh, where we are with these IoT labels. Great. Thank you, Partisans. Um, let's move on to questions and encourage the audience to go ahead and, and go ahead and ask questions. I'll, I'll get to as many as I can. You can actually go back to some of the questions from round one. That would be great for this panel as well. But Sarah, I'm going to start with you and direct a, a question to you. And this is, again, whenever I say it's a simple question, it's not. But let me start with a simple question. Why has it taken so long for the broadband nutrition label to happen? Um, you know, assuming the BIF, the bipartisan infrastructure framework, which is in the, in the alphabet soup that is DC, the BIF is one of the dumber ones. But anyway, assuming it gets passed, and I guess we can no longer assume, but it will become law. And actually, we required um, kind of you know, a little bit about the HPOs. It's going to be a safe harbor, kind of optional for ISPs. But this will be required. Um, but why is it taking so long? Well, I, I think part of it is we are... Um, that the, the, the fight to close the digital divide happens on multiple fronts, right? We are um, trying to improve the competitive landscape uh, across the internet ecosystem more generally. We have, uh, as Consumer Reports have, and uh, many other groups focused on um, subsidy programs, like the Lifeline program, and more recently, the Emergency Broadband Benefit, and then in the, um, in the BIF, the Affordable Connectivity Fund, to really help um, immediately mitigate the high costs that our cost of connectivity report found um, uh, at an individual uh, level. Um, and there's many other, you know, aspects of this work. And so I think that, um, you know, and, and I think that while policymakers and the public more generally have long understood the importance of the internet in sort of an abstract sense. I think it's the, the pandemic and the way that that shifted how we engage with technology and our reliance on internet access has really laid bare um, the need for internet that is both robust and affordable and, and the, the harms that occur when, um, when disparate ac access exists. And so there is this sort of urgency of the moment um, that has shown a spotlight on the problem that I think um, led policy make, has led policymakers to look to concrete things that they can do to, to really move the needle. And, and we feel that the um, broadband nutrition label is one way to do that. Now, it's part of a suite of things. And I think it's important to note that transparency is important in the, um, I'm sorry, my cat has uh, decided to join this panel. Um, and won't leave. Uh, 
<laughs> and so, um, yeah, so the, the, the broadband nutrition label would be like a user focused uh, uh, mechanism for transparency. We've also long urged the FCC to collect pricing data directly from um, internet service providers so that we have a better, um, more comprehensive understanding, or that the FCC at least has a better, more comprehensive understanding of the landscape around the price of internet, in addition to um, the sort of point of purchase or point of subscriber um, transparency that we believe is needed as well. So there, there's lots of moving parts. Um, and I think that's why we've seen, I will, I will note though, that um, while I mentioned a number of bills where, and the executive order where this issue uh, is active, uh, we did see a lot of progress on the broadband nutrition labels back in 2015 and 2016. And so if you'll indulge me for just a moment as I kind of, because I think this is an often overlooked part of the nutrition label story, uh, broadband nutrition label story. Um, as many people who have been following tech policy know, in 2015, the FCC passed the Open Internet Order, which did a whole bunch of things to help preserve net neutrality uh, in the United States. Um, it also included very robust transparency provisions, and um, it, di it directed the Consumer Advisory Committee at the FCC to create um, a safe harbor for compliance with those transparency provisions. So the idea was is that if a company didn't want to sort of like read through all the transparency rules and figure out a system of transparency themselves, that they could just use this thing that was created by um, the Consumer Advisory Committee, which involves companies, consumer representatives, other uh, digital rights groups. Um, and uh, so has inputs from all. And what came out of that consumer advisory committee process was actually a model nutrition label based on OTI's recommendations from 2009. And so we have a report contemporaneous that we put out contemporaneous with that process. Um, uh, and that gives our framework for how we think about um, broadband nutrition labels. But you know, I, I do think this is an arc, and we're at a pivotal moment where we could see major progress. But it it has involved um, a history and um, and varying degrees of interest from policymakers over time as well. Thank you, Sarah. And we can we can get into internet pricing maybe a little bit later if we have time. And kind of what industry tells us is a very rosy picture, and and what consumers are telling us. We've done some work here at CR as well, um, as you know. But um, but really, sort of why there is even the basic. Why do we even need this label? And the answer is, well, you can ask the ISPs why, but we as consumers know why. Uh, Kasha, I want to turn it over to you next. I have to ask you a question. Um, as someone who's not a data scientist, but is fascinated by these issues, how I just want to better understand how labeling and transparency um, at, your, at the project you're on working on, how does that translate to the world of artificial intelligence? Kind of like if we could see five years into the future, um, and where does labeling fit into that? Yeah, uh, it's just the simple questions, huh? Um, yeah, so I mean, it's, it's a really good question. There's so many parts. I'll just say some things. And then if you want me to keep going in some direction, you can let me know. Um, you know, I think that labeling as an act, as we've kind of like heard from other people, provides transparency and then through that choice. Um, and a lot of the conversation about AI today is really not about choice. I mean, we're, we're all kind of the uh, our data is being leveraged by algorithms that then make decisions for us. Uh, and so there's not often a, a way to say, oh, I would like you to make decisions with my data, or I'd like you to make a decision using AI for me um, versus not. Uh, it's usually just a binary of you get to use the service or you don't, essentially. Um, so I think that the labeling, you know, is a, it, it's kind of, like I said before, it's kind of a cultural change to say that we need to drive some kind of transparency into this process of making AI. And by doing so, I think consumers become more aware of what's actually happening, which sometimes is quite scary, um, just to become aware of what's actually going on in the world of AI and how things are being built. Um, it also then, you know, drives change when there is real change, you know, because people can, oh, sorry, choice when there is real choice, when people can say, I'd like to choose this over that. Um, and that's kind of why we as a group decided to focus on the data. So there are, there are a, a number of initiatives out there that look at the model um, and, you know, the, the algorithm itself um, or algorithmic system. There's model cards, there's um, fact sheets, there's a bunch of groups that are doing kind of similar things in terms of documentation. I think often the label outside of tech will be called a label and then inside of tech will be called a new form of documentation. Um, 
And then there's kind of the work that we're doing, which is focusing specifically on the data, because that's where we feel people are actually empowered to make a choice. Um, and when I say people, I mean practitioners who are building who are building the algorithmic systems uh, themselves. Uh, so, you know, in my example from before, someone's asked to go find a data set, you might go and Google it, you'll find, and like literally people are just Googling things. And you might just find, here are a few different data sets that I can use for this purpose. I might find them, uh, you know, through census, or I might find them on Kaggle, or I might find them in some open repository hosted by a university someplace. There are benchmarking data sets that people sometimes use. If you're in lending, you might just decide to go use, you know, Credit Karma or Lending Trees data, which is open. And so people are just going out there finding data. And at that moment, when a data scientist is deciding whether or not to use that data, she has a choice, right? And, and I think that that's, that to us is the opportunity for a label is to say, if there's a really quick way to compare what the data sets are that you're able to find on the internet or even through a service or data repository, these kinds of things, um, uh, then you can make better decisions about what you actually do with that data. And then, um, you know, when you have the data and you're building an algorithmic system on that data, you can say, all right, we need to think about representation in this data set. So on the label, it says, this data set may not be representative um, with respect to skin tone, like on the melanoma data set, or you know, this medical data was actually uh, sampled from patients who are mostly based in Asia, right? And so if you're gonna go and build a model that is not gonna be deployed in Asia, you need to think about whether it matters that all the data that's captured in that data set is actually built on a different population, it's capturing a different population. Um, maybe it does matter, maybe it doesn't. So, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, where we've targeted our, our labeling uh, technique and our initiative is at the data level. Because again, we believe that it kind of brings transparency and real choice around something that data scientists can actually do and are doing every day, which is deciding which data to use to then build a model. So I, I guess I'll pause there for a second. I think that's kind of uh, our angle into how labeling um, ultimately impacts uh, the quality of AI. It's an excellent, excellent answer, Kasha. And, and for the first time in my career, I've been at CR from I'm coming up on my fifth year anniversary. I work very, for the first time in my career, I work with data scientists and they're super careful about when we say it's a nationally representative survey, for example. Um, a quick follow-up question, if I may, before I forget. With regards to your labeling at the Data Nutrition Project, would those be readable by automated machines or is it just for data scientists? Just curious. That's a really good question, and, and we've gone back and forth a number of times on how much of the information could be read, could be machine readable, but also could be created by a machine. Um, so, so there are there is there are people in a camp that says uh, this should be really easy to create. So, when you create a data set, you should be able to just hit a button, and then a tool goes through it, and then it creates a label, and that's it. And then there are people totally on the other side, and I think data sheets for data sets out of um, Microsoft is a good example of this, where they're like, nothing should be done in an automated fashion. This is a conversation, right? And, and the most important things that you can learn about a data set, you will never see in the data set. It's who was not talked to, who funded this? <laughs> you know, what was the time period over which this data was collected and where? And what were the methods, right? Um, was there a quality or an ethical review on this? How did you clean the data? This is a huge question. And those are things that you will never see in an automated fashion or through a tool. Um, so what we've done is, you know, what you would do in, in if, if you're just a person who's trying to bridge that, which is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> so some of the things in, in, the, uh, in the label, you can think of the metadata basically for the label are somewhat more automatable. So it's just kind of like maybe a binary flag. This is about people, this is not about people. This includes information at individual level. This is just aggregated. Um, so that those are things that you could compare or read very quickly. Then there are some things that we do try to pull out that are more conversation starters, um, because uh, our, our belief, our opinion is that in this industry, we need more people thinking and fewer machines doing. So instead of making, instead of enabling a fully automated process here, we actually want to force people to sit down and think um, because the machine can't tell you whether the fact that the data came from Asia to build a model in Europe, the machine can't tell you whether that's a problem. You really need to have a human sit down and say, is that gonna be a problem in this case or is that okay? Um, so it's kind of a combination of both to, your, to answer your question quickly. No, I, I think it's one of the most fascinating issues with AI is how much human control will there be moving forward and will it, you know, or will there be the singularity? Um, Pardis, let's move on to you. Um, if I gave you a magic wand and I think we saw a little bit with the sample label you put up there, but 
what would a label look like or what's the most important thing if you could have this magic wand and create a label for connected devices? And some of this goes to the questions um, from panel one and maybe we could get into that as well, but let's just start with the general and, and maybe we can get specific uh, with some of the questions we're receiving with, with our, that more speak to your issues. Yeah, sure. Uh, great question. Um, so I think uh, if I have this magic wand, I would just create the label as I showed. <laughs> Basically, but uh, but the label is just like a design. It's not. I mean, it's really important to understand that the design is is important. Definitely is important. But we spend a lot of time not just on the design of it. it. It was on the content of this label. So I think the content is really important. It just we need to make sure that any sort of labeling for smart devices or for other types of products for data sets, it's really important to make sure that it's understandable to people and it conveys risk to them. These two, I think are really important. And we basically conduct a series of studies, both with experts and consumers to make sure that they understand what they're looking at and whether it actually would convey some sort of risk to them, whether it would just make them not purchase a device or to purchase a device, whether they can reason about privacy and security practices. And that is really important. That education part is really important. Uh, but basically, I think there are like specific privacy and security practices that uh, it's really important for smart devices to disclose. For example, what type of data this device is collecting, who the data is being shared with, who the data is being sold to, uh, for how long the data is being kept, the retention time. Uh, these are, let's say, for privacy practices. And then on security side, whether the device receives security updates what is the lifetime of the security updates? For how long the device receives security updates? Whether there is any uh, vulnerability disclosure program and how people can find out about this program. So I think there are specific things that we can see on the, uh, on the documents, on the security and privacy uh, documents and standardization. And they're like some of the common privacy and security practices that I just mentioned. But in general, whatever we put on the label, we just need to make sure that it's understandable to people and it conveys risk to them, basically. I think this is the, really the message that I want to convey. Uh, but yeah, just ask me like more uh, detailed question if there's anything that you want me to talk more about on that. Great, thanks, Parnas. That's a, it's a great introduction um, and answer. I, I think sitting here in 2021, there is a whole business model of surveillance capitalism that is reliant upon consumers not really knowing and not really caring to know. Um, so it's difficult. And that leads me to my next question, kind of for the panel, um, is where is industry when it comes to this debate? Um, I think I, I have a general sense, I certainly do with the ISPs and what Sarah introduced us to, but are there areas where they're aligned or are they just generally resistant or are there some cases where companies are outright of outright opposed to increased transparency and labeling. I mean, I know lobbying with OTI on the broadband nutrition label. I mean, I just ask congressional staffers, ask the cable lobbyists what they have to hide about not telling us what consumers are paying for internet service. But, but this is for the panel, so anybody can take it. And let's just talk about the other side and, and where are they in this debate? We can jump, jump in since you sort of teed it up there, John. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the the objection so the objections tend to focus on either this would be cumbersome or for either because it's a lot of information to disclose, arguably, um, uh, or it's the consumers won't use it, like that people won't know how to use it. And I think we talked on the, the previous, they talked on the previous panel about the need to have sort of like social infrastructure in surrounding the rollout and the use of these types of, of labels, because uh, people need to make, we need to make sure that the people have the right information and context to understand what's in them. Um, and I think Pardis's example of the feedback loop that they got from, from actual, uh, consumers is, is, is a good uh, reflection of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's, I, I think it's getting harder and harder to say that this type of disclosure isn't needed when researchers at an organization that focuses um, significantly on the cost uh, of internet access and, and, the, and work to close the digital divide struggled over the course of a year 
plus to put together this latest version of the report. And, you know, we are sort of experts in the space and devoting a lot of time to it. And if it's challenging for us to find this information, um, then it's challenging for, for user internet, people using the internet too as well. Um, and I also think that it's, it makes it harder to, to suggest that the market is competitive. We don't know. Like a key factor in a competitive market is the product that's being offered and how much it costs. And right now, there is op there's obscurity around both of those 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 things. So, thanks, Sarah. Tasha. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I feel like, you know, if I think some of the the opportunities that so okay when we say like tech companies, for example, there's a lot of different actors at a tech company. Um, and I think there are um, a lot of different facets. So you can't just say Google wants this or doesn't want this. Um, I do think that there are a few different frameworks that are helpful for me at least. One is kind of the top down, bottom up, right? So from like a top down perspective, we've talked to companies that really wanna do something around uh, data set transparency or AI transparency because it mitigates risk. Um, we've also heard that, you know, there's kind of a PR opportunity there about, oh, we're doing responsible and ethical things. Um, you know, obviously the congressional <laughs> hearings yesterday uh, from our t testimony yesterday from the ex Facebook uh, PM, I think it's very in the in the ether right now, this this question of responsible tech and what um, big, big companies are supposed to do about it. Um, and then from kind of a bottom up perspective, a lot of data scientists don't have standards internally. And so even if it's just transparency or documentation internally, I think there's a greater and greater push to do something. On the opposite side of that, you know, I think some of the challenges are systemic. So kind of, kind of what Sarah said, this is cumbersome. Who's actually gonna do this? There's no role or group or obvious fit for who would be responsible for this, who would be the one who's kind of defining what's in it, if it's going to be an internal standard. So there's kind of operational and organizational change that has to take place in order to support this. And what, what I've seen before is that you have a champion internally who just really cares uh, about data quality or AI ethics, but they also have another job. You know, and, and unless you actually have somebody who has the resources and the time and the energy to do something and, and are um, supported by the organization, it's really tough to, to drive that change. And then similarly, kind of the questions of, well, how do you justify that? Why do we really need it? Um, and so unless you have consumers who are clamoring for it, which is hard in AI because consumers are kind of a few levels down, um, uh, from from the actual, I mean, it's hard to see the, it's hard to see the impact of the AI because uh, you don't know what other decisions it could have made. Um, so you know, consumers aren't really clamoring. Regulation isn't quite there yet, um, and so a lot of people say, "Well, we're doing fine anyway. We're making tons of money. So why would we need to to implement this?" Um, so th that's kind of what I see in terms of the opportunities, but also the challenges. Thank you, Tasha. Artis, anything you want to add in terms of you know, sort of what what's it like working with device manufacturers? Yeah, sure. So the way I see this, uh, this IoT uh, market is really the concept of uh, market for lemons, basically. So the idea here is uh, consumers really don't appreciate uh, security and private good devices with good security and privacy. At, at least this is how we see this, but that is really not the case because they don't really have information about security and privacy. So they cannot really appreciate a, a good device uh, in terms of security and privacy. And so then manufacturers see that consumers do not really appreciate security and privacy, they appreciate the quality of the device. So they would just uh, spend their money and resources on those features, on those aspects that would bring them money. And over time, basically we're gonna have uh, devices on the market that are not amazing in terms of security and privacy. And they're not transparent about their practices because that is really not cost effective for manufacturers. So this is a really huge issue. And I think a label actually would really help manufacturers to uh, gain consumers trust and just for the, for the market competition. I think this is really good for manufacturers to have, but I think I mentioned this in my introduction that uh, we are really trying to find manufacturers to pilot the label and we still haven't found them. Uh, and it's also really important to know that it's not a binary thing that you should either adopt the whole label or just don't adopt anything basically, don't just disclose any information. It's 
even if a manufacturer comes and just say that, okay, there are like specific things that we think we can talk about, it, it's a good start. We just need some, like a company come, comes forward and just say that, okay, we would like to disclose this information to consumers. We would like to help them make an informed purchase decision. But I think there's a resistance uh, from manufacturers to adopt the label or even parts of the label. And I think, uh, and that is in the US, in other countries or like some countries, for example, Finland and Singapore, but that we see that we have IoT labels. So in the US, this is a very new thing and we still have resistance and hopefully we are going to have less of that in the future. Uh, but this is my experience uh, in trying to push the labels uh, to manufacturers that we see that they're not exactly coming forward to adopt the label. Well, well Pardis, you unknowingly gave me a great segue to my next question, which is where are the politics on here? I mean, in broadband nutrition label, Congress is forcing them to do it. And sometimes you've got to pass a law. And this also kind of dovetails with a question I got from the audience. How challenging is this politically um, in all the three, dis three different areas? Um, Artists, you want to just take first stab at that? or um, But yeah, that's for the panel. Like, where, what are the politics around this? What, I mean, is it state legislatures? Is it Congress? I know there have been some right to repair laws that CR has worked on in the state level. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, so in US, there are like two uh, major policy orders that I can think of. Uh, in late March uh, 2021, Congress and Senate reintroduced uh, the Cyber Shield Act. This legislation creates a voluntarily cybersecurity certification program for consumer IoT devices. And as part of this policy, there will be an advisory board, including diverse experts from industry, academia, government, and consumer groups to specify a cybersecurity benchmark for smart devices. Manufacturers can then attach a cyber shield label to their products, voluntarily certifying that their devices meet this benchmark. So that was the first thing. The second one uh, came very recently, May 2021, when a White House executive order was signed to improve the nation's cybersecurity and protect the federal government's networks. As part of this executive order, uh, the National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, basically has been commissioned to work with some federal, some appropriate federal agencies to set up a pilot program to really understand how the labeling for smart devices should look like, which they are currently working on that basically. Uh, and that was like in the US, but as I just said, the, the discussions in the US are very new. Uh, they, it just got started. But in other countries such as Singapore and Finland, we have the labels. For example, in Singapore, we have a star rating. Uh, the labels look like a four star rating. And in Finland, we have this uh, we have this mark, security mark. That, for example, if your device uh, satisfies some requirements, you, your device can get a security mark to just show consumers that this device is secure uh, to some sense, basically. Uh, yeah. So this is, I think, where we are with legislations in U.S. and other countries, um, and I hope to see more of them uh, in the future. <laughs> Tasha, Sarah, anything to add on the politics? Uh, I mean, very briefly, because I'm really not a policy guy. I, I think it, most likely um, we'll see policy shifts with an eye towards potential harms to humans. So I think there's going to be kind of, you see already risk assessments or algorithmic impact assessments, which say what are high risk and what are low risk. Um, and those might start to be required um, especially within use in government. So if you have a you know, specific domain, say medical, financial, um, you know, these are the, the big ones that have to do with humans, uh, and you, there are government agencies that are building algorithms using data uh, that help to, say, distribute resources, make decisions about citizens or non-citizens as well, that I think is is one opportunity to start to see some change. So you might have uh, some kind of internal data or algorithmic standards that are required for use within government. And then I think, you know, on the kind of flip side of that, 
uh, policies or, or um, initiatives around algorithmic accountability, transparency, data set quality standards, all of these that are required of big tech. I think that's around the corner as well, but obviously um, way more complicated in terms of lobbying. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, there's a huge push within the tech industry to kind of self-regulate as opposed to having regulation um, put on them. So uh, that's kind of what I'm seeing is um, movement inside government uh, and then hopefully movement outside government, but with a lot of pushback. I think that's right, Kasha. In, in my time in politics, the, the, the self-regulation narrative is usually a sign that they're worried that something's coming. That someone Sarah. should be regulated, yeah. <laughs> Sarah? Yeah, I think I've covered a little bit of the landscape already, but just to kind of like put a bow on it, I think that the politics have shifted. This is clearly something that has captured the interest of policymakers, um, including the, the president, uh, who, in, who very explicitly included a, the broadband nutrition label and a, a mandate to the FCC to implement it in the competition executive order from this summer earlier, earlier this year. Um, and I think the inclusion of the broadband nutrition label in the infrastructure package is a sign uh, of something that, that I believe should be true, which is that this should be a bipartisan, something that, that we want across both sides of the political aisle. Transparency is, um, is hard to argue with. And we're talking about such basic transparency about what it is that we're expecting people to purchase. And, um, and, and so uh, I'm hopeful that we're, we're hitting a point um, uh, and I, I'm sure that former former policy folks who have worked on this issue uh, at OTI over the years are probably <laughs> squirming, waiting for this to finally move uh, past the finish line, because it really has been in the works even since before I joined 10 and a half years ago. Um, but I, yeah, I think we're really hitting the moment where this, this could actually um, uh, happen. And I think, as I've said before, this isn't the end all to be all um, around the question of broadband affordability um, or, or access more broadly. But this is, I think, a, a very um, concrete step that we could take as soon as the infrastructure bill is passed uh, to, to move the ball forward. No, there are a lot of challenges and failures in the broadband market, having occupied that space with you, Sarah, for many years. And a lot of it comes down to competition as well. We did a broadband survey in June that found that, lo and behold, when there's competition in a market, consumers pay on average seven to eight, nine, ten dollars less a month for the same service. Um, I'm looking here. I think we're kind of running out of questions, which is fine. Um, but yeah, is there anything anybody wants to add before we close out? Um, I guess a general question I might have, part is it was kind of it came into the first panel. As more and more devices become connected. You know, your toaster, your fridge, um, but certainly let's look at a bigger purchase like a car. What if you'd start disabling some of these things? You know, how much is, is it built into where the car will still drive, even if you're not connected 24 seven to Nissan Connect, for example, as a Nissan owner? Yeah, that's that's a really great question. Yeah, I heard that uh, from the first panel as well. So basically um, on our label, for example, we have uh, two fields on the label, on the secondary layer of the label. One of them is saying functionality went offline and the second one is functionality with no data processing. And so the idea here is the manufacturer should basically disclose whether uh, if the device is dumped, basically, if you turn off, whether you can basically turn off the how smart the device is, the, the intelligence of the device. And if you do so, whether the device still works and to some, to what extent, the device still works. Uh, so we have that on the label and we really hope manufacturers would disclose that information. But this is something that when we talk to consumers of smart devices, they actually really like to see that thing on the label. Basically, they were saying that, um, I think I, meant, I also heard this uh, from the first panel that the TVs that you're like purchasing uh, on the market right now, many of them are smart. So basically the question here is, can I turn this off? Uh, and if I do so, what functionality do I still get? So it is on the label and we hope that they disclose it, but we'll see, nothing is, uh, nothing is forced basically in this space. 
Thank you, Parnas. No, I, I certainly do not have a knack for business, but I want to believe that there's a market out there for dumb devices because <laughs> you can get any kind of accessory or like a PS4 or PS5 to give you the smart TV connectivity. I just want a big, beautiful screen that's dumb. Um, but anyway, that's just me. Um, anything else? I'm going to check the questions board. No, I think that's about it. So Sarah, Kasha, unless you have any closing comments, otherwise I'm happy to Thank OTI, OTI for hosting us today. Um, certainly a lot of our work, both at OTI and CR and, and with our panel today is, is educating consumers because a lot of sort of a, huh, I didn't know that moment. So I, I think it was great listening today and learning and I really appreciate OTI for hosting this. Um, Andy, uh, if else, anybody else wants to raise their hand with one final thought, otherwise I'm gonna toss it back to Andy and, and we'll close it out here. So thank you everybody. Uh, my final thoughts, just thank you for, for having us and uh, for uh, engaging in this in this discussion. Enjoyed the first panel as well. So was, uh, thanks again. Andy, I'll pass the baton back to you. Great. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I think of the events I've done, this has had such a wide ranging um, group of issues. And often we find people come to a New America event because they're an expert on one of the things being talked about. And there were so many today that I really hope that um, attendees managed to learn about stuff they'd never thought about before. Uh, if you would like further information or to follow our work, all of the panelists have their Twitter uh, handles listed on the invitation, as well as you could follow us at OTI or Consumer Reports at CR Advocacy uh, to keep up with sort of the work going on all of these issues, as well as how you could get involved and advocate for better labels yourself.